Cincinnati. Also, a company is going forth down to the <coughs> itself, uh, collects more things of, of both types of animals that were being found now. You know, uh, by the way, was just the teeth of the second animal? Well, we're not sure. In fact, maybe some of these bones and tusks that we had been finding up till now were, in fact, bones and tusks of the second animal as well as bones and tusks of the first animal. Because obviously there were two elephant like animals at the lake. You know, right? they would get what, what in heaven's name these things were. Anyway, Mary Weather Lewis stops here. And, uh, you know, uh, coming through the Cincinnati area, stops here. And in fact, not only visits Goforth and looks at what he's got here in Cincinnati, also accompanies Goforth down to the lake itself, uh, collects more things of, of both types of animals that were being found now. You know, uh, by the way, was just the teeth of the second animal? Well, we're not sure. In fact, maybe some of these bones and tusks that we had been finding up till now were, in fact, bones and tusks of the second animal as well as bones and tusks of the first animal. Because obviously there were two elephant-like animals at the lake. You know, right? They would get what, what in heaven's name these things were. Anyway, Mary Weather Lewis stops here and uh, you know puts all those bones that he gets uh, on a boat. And per Jefferson's instruction, instead of trying to go up the, the river, they went with the current down the river. And the boat then down, oh, down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River. Not, not a special boat, the typical boats in those days, going down to New Orleans from Cincinnati. Um, and then in New Orleans, the, the bones then would be transferred to an ocean-going vessel, which would take them around Florida, past, you know, uh, past Cuba, around Florida, up the east coast of Baltimore, offload them there. And, uh, take them that way and go over to Washington, D.C. At least that was the plan. <laughs> this, this collection of bones, which is again a, quite a sizable collection, is sitting off of Natchez, Mississippi, in the bottom of the Mississippi River. <laughs> it's been very difficult to get these bones to Jefferson. Uh, so, so here we go again. Poor Jefferson. Uh, no luck. No luck whatsoever. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Meriwether Lewis, of course, uh, continues on to, to Louisville, Kentucky, not knowing this was going to happen to the bones that he had so meticulously collected. Uh, met up with this guy, William <coughs> Clark, and Lewis and Clark took off then for the St. Louis area in the following year, and in fact for the following three years from 1804 to 1806, uh, went on their famous western expedition. One of the reasons for the expedition, one of the directions given to them by Jefferson was to look for animals, <coughs> the, the, the animals that were being found in the lit. Because remember, Jefferson was pretty convinced that no animals ever became extinct, and these animals therefore were walking around out beyond where we had been before. Uh, Lewis and Clark uh, did not find those animals, by the way, uh, just, just in case you're wondering. Uh, okay. uh, meanwhile, I mentioned 1806 because that was the last year of the Lewis and Clark expedition. They were on their way back from Oregon uh, to St. Louis. Uh, in that year, also, back we go to Paris, France. The newest hot commodity at the uh, Museum of Natural History in Paris was this, was this guy, Georges Cuvier, who was, according to some people in this room, probably the greatest scientist of the 19th century, if you didn't know any of your fossil background. Uh, anyway, Cuvier, among other things, uh, knew his fossils, knew his bones, and they had a, quite a collection of bones there in the Paris Museum by this time to, to study from Big Bone Lake. And also he had been to other museums in uh, you know, Amsterdam and London and looked at those uh, materials that they had from the lick. And also these bones of these unknown animals are starting to, starting to pop up at other places other than Big Bone Lick. As people started looking at bogs and so on, you know, turns out that Big Bone Lick was not singular uh, in, in, in having such big bones in it. Cuvier, um, of course, uh, you know, studying all these various bones, and then some diagrams in the books as well. This, again, is a, the, the first bone that came out of the lick and is still over at the Paris Museum of Natural History. Uh, being a French scientist, though, he, he was especially interested in, 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 in the teeth, uh, and I think this has to be being a Frenchman that he was. He saw, when he looked at these teeth, of uh, human female breasts. See? I mean, that is a jump. He said, well, he said, look at that. And he therefore named this animal. He called this the mastodon, which means breast tooth. So he invented the name on the basis of uh, what the cusp looking like the uh, breast of female uh, humans, and uh, from that coming up with a name for what up until now is still an unknown animal, uh, but now at least it has a name. 
beyond that, he takes all the knowledge of the bones of this animal, puts them all together, and comes up with the first diagram, uh, really closest diagram to truth that, that had been put together by this point. The diagram having pretty much everything on it, not the cranium, because the cranium never preserved well, it didn't seem. It never kept, never found pieces of, of the cranium, you know, at, at least by 1806. And the tusks, I guess, just didn't fit on this piece of paper. <laughs> he, just, he just didn't put the tusks on there, uh, but you can see where they are. You, you can see the, those teeth there uh, in the mouth of this animal, the Grand Mastodonte, uh, uh, as they called it in France. Uh, so he came up, and he didn't stop there. He said, not only is this probably the original unknown animal of the lake, which I'm now going to call a mastodon, uh, an elephant-like animal, uh, which uh, then, as time went on, started to get some artistic renderings uh, put out about it with its musculature and its skin on, therefore looking like, like an elephant, but, but a much lower head. This is not a brilliant animal. I mean, look at that cranium there. It's just not much of a cranium whatsoever as compared to if you think of, a, of, a, of an elephant, much more of a dome on its head. But a, a massive animal, uh, much, much more heavily muscled uh, uh, than, than the elephants, uh, the African Asian elephants that we, that we still have today. Uh, but, but as I started to say though, not only in his 1806 paper did Cuvier come up with this animal, the mastodon, he also came up with this second mystery, which had recently come out at the lick, and that is, well, what's the identity of the other animal, the one who contributed these teeth and perhaps some of the big bones and some of the, even maybe some of the big tusks? Cuvier, being in Europe, said, hey, I know this tooth. It's real similar to the teeth of animals which we're finding coming out of the ice in northern Russia, northern Finland, and that's the mammoth. So the mammoth was not originally found at Big Bone Lake. However, the first American mammoths, were identified from Big Bone Lake. Unlike the Mastodon, which was originally the first the type specimen of the American Mastodon, is obviously Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. Uh, when it comes to the mammoth, it certainly was well known to scientists ever since maybe 1500 or 1600 uh, AD, <coughs> and, and known as to what it looked like, too. This is not much of a huge reconstruction. This is just almost a diagram right off the cave wall of France or Spain, because people had been interacting and hunting this animal for, for thousands of years. Uh, but obviously mammoths were not only restricted to the old world, these finds in Big Bone Lick, uh, and then later at other places in North America, uh, pointed out, you know, pointed to the very simple fact that the mammoths obviously had come over into the new world as well. And, and, and here they were, uh, much more elephant-like, if you look again at the dome uh, of the head and, and just the general shape of, of the body. Um, <laughs> Poor Jefferson. <laughs> yeah, here now there were two animals. He didn't have any of them. Meriwether Lewis had gotten some, but those were in the bottom of the Mississippi River off the Anshay. <laughs> here it is, 1807. You know, Meriwether Lewis and Clark come back. Tell Jefferson, by, by the way, they didn't see any such crazy animals uh, in the West whatsoever. They just saw some big animals. They didn't see anything of, of the size of the animals that we found big ball leg. Jefferson says, Dan, I want some of this stuff. So this time he turns to William Clark. And he says to Clark, listen, on your way back west, I want you to stop at Big Bone Lake and get a whole bunch of folks, get a dozen workmen, etc. Take your brother up there, George Rathen, Rogers Clark as well. Maybe take Goforth out there, Dr. Goforth from Cincinnati, who has a lot of knowledge of what's in the lake and where it is, and really get me a bunch of stuff and give it to me. Uh, I'll, a lot of people say that this is the first organized paleontological expedition in the history of North America. Uh, why? Well, because uh, it, it was given a trip leader, it was given funding. Uh, Jefferson personally funded all this, it was not U.S. government funds at all. Um, and, 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 and William Clark, therefore, was the first paleontologist who actually went on an organized expedition uh, to look at it this way. And boy, was he successful. He got to the lake, um, found, in three, four weeks found, hundreds if not thousands of bones, uh, just unbelievable collections. So many of them that you had to ship them out in two different lots, which was lucky, because one of the lots is in the bottom of the harbor in Havana, Cuba. <laughs> 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 and the other one made it all the way down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, transposed from 
uh, New Orleans, uh, you got through the, you know, Havana, up the East Coast, off the road to Baltimore, to the White House, and Thomas Jefferson, later, after all these years, finally had the bones. He took the 300 bones in the shipment that made it and had them laid out in the East Room of the White House, you know, the fancy East Room where all the diplomatic receptions are. <laughs> there were 300 bones, folks, from, 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 from our little paleontological place down here, laid out in the White House. Uh, Jefferson invited scientists of the East Coast, the anatomists at that time, with some understanding of perhaps what was being shown here, uh, and, you know, had them come over and look through this collection and divvied it up. Some of them went to Jefferson's own personal, uh, into his own personal museum, Mount Shello. Uh, several of them went to the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, where they are today. Next time you're in Philly, you can stop and see them live there. And, and strangely enough, a lot of them went to the Paris Museum of Natural History. 